If you'll turn in your Bibles with me, we're going to open our Bibles to John chapter 10. We're going to read what in my Bible is titled, The Good Shepherd and His Sheep. And that is section, the section that is verses 1 through 21. So John chapter 10, beginning with verse 1, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock attacks the flock and it scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them saying, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we have read your word and as we look deeper into it, that our eyes are opened, that the blindness that engulfs us is taken away, that we see the truth of your word, and that we give you honor and glory through your son Jesus, that we live according to your word, and everyone would see your word lived out through us, just as they saw it lived out through Jesus, that they would see authority and how we live and how we speak, because we speak not and live not of our own will and our own ways, but of your will and your ways. Lord, this I pray through Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So we just read the Bible, but I'm going to read to you two quotes that are not from the Bible. First one is from Saul Luckman. He wrote, and I quote, You just need to be convincing enough to fool the public, and that's easy. Unquote. The other one is, Interestingly enough, every time I quarter a fanatic with scientific facts which they cannot argue or disprove, they either dismiss me as anti-God or a secular humanist, or... They start spouting reams of misapplied and irrelevant scripture at me like a good little sheeple. And like that will in any way, shape, or form prove anything. Well, the second quote is from author Christina Engelow. And it is a, obviously, decidedly condemning view of Christianity. This author has quite a reputation for being very outspoken against Christianity and God. 
Not that she's unfamiliar with God. She's, in fact, quite familiar with God. And she even uses several concepts that we find in the Bible in her writings. For example, she's got two books. One's titled, well, she's got many more than that. But one is titled Prodigal Son with a U. She took that from God's Word. At least the concept came from it. And the other one is Demon Spawn. So there's a belief there. What it may be, we're not entirely sure. As well as the concept of resurrection is prominent in many of her books. So her familiarity with God is, is quite obvious. And it's even more obvious if you read any of her, her interviews or you hear any of her interviews. Because regardless of what the topic is, she often takes a turn at uh, putting a shot or two in against Christianity. Doesn't matter what the topic is, doesn't matter if it's relevant or not, she likes to take a little bit of a, a, a poke at it. And it's as I said before, those who would fight against God acknowledge him while simultaneously refusing him. Now the reason that I'm reading these quotes, and, and this will be, become apparent in a second, is because it's relevant to this term sheeple. And I'm going to explain what that is. But let's get to the kind of a synopsis of what these quotes are. The first one literally says that it's easy to fool people in general. While the second one is directed at Christians who believe, are believed to already have been fooled. The wool, see the pun there, has already been pulled over their eyes. Now she uses this term sheeple, which compares people to sheep in being docile, foolish, or easily led. It is an insult, and it's used to basically, and I'm quoting this, call someone a dummy for following a person or ideology without knowing why they are following them. It's blindly following. That's the whole idea behind this. And So there's a couple assumptions made here. The first one is that sheep are actually foolish and blindly follow. But also that Christians are, are likewise uh, foolish and blindly follow because they don't know who or why they follow. Well, I'd like to point out, though, that the, the people that use the term sheeple probably spend too much time at the petting zoo and not enough time learning and understanding the reality of the world. Because the petting zoo is not an accurate depiction of any kind of creature in the wild, or even domesticated. The sheep that you find within a petting zoo are trained to tolerate crowds of people swarming them. And they will follow people around, especially the little ones, because they've learned from experience that they might have a little treat that they can snag from them. Because these little ones don't pay much attention. That or even better, they offer up the snacks. And so they'll follow them around so they, because they understand and they know it. But if you were to walk into a real sheep pasture and you're not the shepherd, the sheep are going to run away. They're going to avoid you. They will stay away from you. They want nothing to do with you because they don't know you. And if you corner them, they're going to put up a fuss. Now, the, the, the amount of fight that a sheep has is not real threatening. They'll move around a lot. They'll run back and forth. They'll make a whole lot of noise. But they're not going to just let you approach them without some sort of a fuss. Because they don't know you. So the idea behind these sheep and, and sheeple, that, that term, you know, real sheep are not as docile, foolish, or easily led as people would like to think. And Jesus makes this plain in these verses. It says he used these figures of, of speech. And these figures of speech were very relatable to the majority of the people that were listening to him. It's likely that most, with the exception of the Pharisees, we're probably nodding in agreement to Jesus' descriptions of sheep behavior. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. You go out in the field, you try and approach these flocks, and they don't know you. Woo, they're gone. And the shepherd's going, you better believe it. That's how I lose half my sheep. Some nimrod walks up to them, not realizing what they're doing. My sheep's go, no, and they run. Way to go, Jesus. Let these people know. 
Keep away from my sheep. I'm tired of going to chase after them because you're carelessly walking through. They understood it. But see, the Pharisees didn't understand it, probably for two reasons. One is because this is a, they wouldn't concern themselves with such a filthy job. Being a shepherd was one of the lowest jobs. This, this is like, this is the worst. It's, it's smelly. Shaggy, smelly sheep. You, there we go. I worked in the song title for you. So they wouldn't concern themselves with the, with the ways of a shepherd. So they probably know nothing about sheep. Other than to sacrifice them. And those sheep are brought to them, most likely. So they've got nothing to do with it. And the other reason, secondly, is they just were not making the connection, no matter how clear it was, and it was because of their own denial, because their own refusal to see the truth, they were not making the connection between what Jesus was saying and the numerous Old Testament references to God's people as sheep. They just weren't getting it. Now, I want, to, I want you to, if you want to, real quick, you can. Otherwise, you probably know it well enough. Hebrews chapter 11, just the first verse. Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith hall of fame. It is the faith chapter, right? And verse 1 starts it all out by saying, Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Well, people like to use this verse especially people that, that talk about sheeple and are trying to disparage Christianity and Christians in general, they use this verse and many like, many like it as examples of how Christians blindly follow without fully understanding the who or why. Because they look at it and they say, well, faith is confidence in what we hope for. So it's hope. So it's not something that you know, right? And, and, it's, and it's assurance about what we don't see. If you don't see it, you don't know, it, right? Well, they're taking this all wrong. They're not understanding. Not only that, but they're taking it out of the context of what faith really is. This is a good synopsis of what faith is. But you need to read God's word and fully understand it. And so it's not just blindly following. Now there are some Christians, I'm not going to lie, there are some Christians that, that it may be the case that, that they are blindly following, that they don't understand but I think there are more exceptions to the norm. Because as, as Christians, if we've read God's word, one, we gain some knowledge here. And so we get a little bit of an understanding. But God calls us. He's called us from the very beginning. He implores us to seek the truth, to search for him, to gain understanding and knowledge, and to develop wisdom. God doesn't want blind obedience. He doesn't want people that are just wandering, in, okay, I'll follow you because, you know, it sounds good. I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm going to follow you because it sounds good. I like what you're saying, and I'll follow you. And there are some people that are like that. There are some that claim to be Christians. I know some of them. Not naming any names, none in here. But I know people that are like that because it's convenient. 9-11 was mentioned this morning. 9-11's come, the anniversary's coming up. And there are a lot of people that were blindly following because they were scared. And it was obvious that they were blindly following because as soon as they felt comfortable again, they left. But God doesn't want that. If God wanted blind obedience, he never would have given us free will. He would have put Adam and Eve in the garden, not given them free will. They never would have rebelled. And guess what? We would be in the garden right now. Adam and Eve? Oh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm planning on having dinner with them tomorrow. Because they'd probably still be around. Because there would be no sin. Because they, we wouldn't have rebelled against God. If there's no sin, there's no death, right? And Jesus never would have existed. There's no need. Because Jesus is the path to redemption, salvation, reconciliation, things that would not be necessary. We wouldn't need any of that if we didn't have free will. So God does not demand blind obedience. He doesn't say, follow me or else.
that may not sit well with some people. Because we know that God says if you don't follow him, that there is an or else, right? But this isn't a bad thing. Typically when you hear do this or else, it's for the benefit of someone or something else. Otherwise, you're going to pay the price. Think about the do this or for else that you've heard in your life. Has it, ever, has it ever been solely for your benefit? It's probably pretty rare that you can think of an or do this or else that's been solely for your benefit and not for the benefit of anyone else. This isn't for God's benefit that he says, follow me. It's for your benefit. But he doesn't... He doesn't force any of this on us. He chooses us. And his desire is that we would choose him. It isn't a relationship that he puts upon us and makes us be a part of it. Instead, he simply makes himself known. And he waits patiently until we discover him, while we discover him, that whole process. And then we make a choice. He doesn't force it upon anybody. You know, it's appropriate that Christians are called sheep, because like the ruminant mammals, and ruminants, that means they got multiple stomachs and the food moves around. We won't get into that. But we are like them. Christians are like sheep because we are very cautious of the unknown. Because we do like to know things. Right? We don't just blindly follow. We like to understand. We seek to learn and grow and we trust what we know and we follow who we know to be good. So this whole idea about sheep being easily led, it's, it's, it's false. It's a myth. I want to give you another myth. I want to talk to you about another myth. Have you ever heard the myth about lemmings? If you're not familiar, lemmings are, are small rodents that are common to the Arctic regions. And the myth is, is that during mass migrations, they all run off cliffs to their death. And that's the myth. But there's a lot of fact that actually is basing that myth, that's, that's building up that myth. Because they do, in fact, move en masse when a colony becomes too large. So you'll get this large group that will move off and they'll search for new territory. And when they're searching for new territory, they charge ahead. They're fearless in a lot of ways. And they love water. They're actually pretty good swimmers. And so when they come to a river, they jump in. They dive in. And these, these, these behaviors have been observed many times in, in some of the earliest recorded observations of this happening, of these carpets, that it's like a carpet of fur moving along the ground. And they just move until they find where they're going, until they find this new territory that they're going to be, so that they can separate from this old colony that's become too big. And they move along, and they come to waterways, and they don't think about it, they simply jump in. There's no caution, there's no evaluating the situation and saying, eh, you know what? I'm going to find a different way. They just jump in. And as they're going and they're moving, these, these, a lot of these rivers that they come to aren't nice, gentle, sloping banks into the water. A lot of them have a little bit higher banks. It might be six inches. It might be a foot, three foot. And so they jump over. And this is where that myth is perpetuated because they jump over into the water. And because they don't, they throw caution to the wind. Literally, they just jump in. Sometimes they're jumping into water that's very treacherous for such a small creature. And so many of them don't make it. Or because they're moving in such a, a, a dense mass as they go into the water, they're just like tumbling on top of one another. They're essentially trampling one another in the water, resulting in great losses. So people have seen them going over these banks into the water and so many of them not surviving and so they say, oh, they just jump into their death. They're suicidal. Well, they're not suicidal, but the problem is, is 
they're, 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 they're following they're following these, these creatures, and it's not even, generally, it's not even the alpha. They figured out it's not even the alpha, whether it's alpha male or alpha female. They're not even following the alpha. They're just following the fastest lemming. This guy happens to be running faster than everybody, and they're just following him, and he sees the water, and he's like, no big deal, I can make it. He just jumps in, and everybody else follows. They don't even think about it. They're not pausing a moment to... to see if this is something that, that, that could be a problem. There's no concern for their own safety. The first one doesn't even have concern for, a safe, for anyone else's safety. This first lemming is just like, I'm going to go. He doesn't care who's following him because, again, most often times it's not the alpha. It's not an actual leader. It's just the fastest guy. And so they're jumping in. And, and, and I know we can say, well, it's just... It's just dumb animals, right? It's just uh, dumb animals. You know, ultimately, every year, so many lemmings are dying because they rush to follow one who's only concerned for their own safety, their own crossing. And they plunge into danger. There's no consideration. There's no thinking about it. And we say, dumb animals. But animals are capable, even small rodents, they're capable of recognizing, assessing, and avoiding dangers. If you doubt that, Brian, you're the hunter I know is in here. <laughs> he knows. Animals know. They can assess the danger. That's why when, when before the kids were born, we were talking about getting a small, small rodent type animal as a pet. We went to the pet store and I said, you know, I'm not a big fan of hamsters. They tend to bite a lot more than what people think. And we were talking with one of the ladies at the pet store, and she says, yeah, and they're pretty dumb, too. You, you stand there, and this is, about, this is about four and a half, five feet. This is about five feet off the ground. You stand with a hamster in your hand right here. It'll look down and say, four, five feet, I can make that. Boom. Injured or dead. She says, now over here, we got these little brown mice. Oh, they're so cute. And they're smart. They sit in your hand right here, and they go, mm, I think I'll crawl down you. How about that? Might be a little more work, but hey, I'm going to be alive in the end. Animals are capable of doing this. They're capable of assessing a situation and avoiding danger. And lemmings, they don't. They just rush right in. They're, I guess they're hamsters. I guess you could use hamsters as another example. So this is, this is this myth that is based on so much reality. And the reason I bring this up is because there are so many lemmings because lemmings are, are a factual as opposed to sheep are a factual example of a creature that will blindly follow without knowing why and they'll follow into danger they'll follow into bad situations and I'm going to mention one, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about two sides of the, of the aisle okay so don't, don't think I'm for one side or the other. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little bit on both sides of the aisle. Not the aisle here, political aisle. There are people that claim to be social justice warriors, yet they don't have a clue that social justice is defined as in which distribution of resources is equitable. Now, many people try and say, well, equity is, is, is that's about you know, fair access, right? No. That's equality. Equal opportunity. Okay? But that's not what social justice is about. Equal opportunity is that everybody has an equal opportunity. Equity, in what social justice is based on, equity is, say, is saying that, okay, these 10 people outdid everybody else and they earned their spot. But they don't fit a good diversity. So we're going to take away these three people from this, that they earned it, and we're going to put these three people that didn't earn it just because they fit the diversity. That's what equity is. It has nothing to do with equality. It has nothing to do about out opportunity. It has everything to do with outcome. Okay? And people follow that, even though they don't realize what it is. Okay, I said I'm going to hit a little bit on both sides of the, of the aisle. The other is that people like to say that Biden isn't their president. 
and that the election was fraudulent. Well, they follow an ideology that's not supported by the systems in place. You know, everyone's innocent until proven guilty. Yet folks that are saying this are saying, well, no, Biden's fault, Biden's guilty without any proof. Now, and the election was completely, completely fraudulent. Now, were there some issues? There were certainly some issues. But the overwhelming amount of evidence that has been brought forth to this point is that the election was won by Biden. And so if you are an American citizen, he is your president. But people follow because they got other people that are saying, well, he's not my president. And so they just follow. They don't have, they don't have a clue because they don't do the work. They don't do the research and find out what the facts are. They don't accept truth when it's presented to them. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Truth is true. But people are following these things. And so in each of these cases, whether it's one side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle, because more often than not, you're going to find the social justice warriors on one side, and you're going to find the people that say Biden's not my president on the other side. So that's why I'm saying that. But in each of these cases, there are examples of lemmings. There are people that are following a person or an ideology without fully knowing the what, when, who, why of why they're following. It's because it sounds good. Because it feels good. Because it doesn't fit with what I want. And so they follow. They don't have a clue why. They just do. And I think the reason, I, I'm going to go back to Angela's quote, the very last line. Because she, she makes these comments, like they're presenting all this information, blah, 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 they're doing all this. And my favorite part is she says, like, that will in any way, shape, or form prove anything. She knows of God, but it changes nothing for her because she does not want it to. She will blindly follow. People like this will blindly follow because it's not convenient because it makes them feel good. Because it's easy. Not because they did the work and they understand the reasons and the whys and the hows. No, it's just because someone else did and I trust them, so I'm going to go with what they say. And that's so prevalent of the world around us today. People like to choose. They choose to follow people and ideologies that, that are, are completely foolish, that are completely easily disprovable, that are ever changing. There's so many of the ideologies that people are flocking to right now that are constantly shifting and changing from one thing to another, even to the point of contradicting yourself from one day to another. And yet they constantly go into these. The only constant in these things is change itself. And yet it's Christians, the ones that put in the work, that learn, that study something that has been unchanging for 6,000 years, for 2,000 years for the New Testament. It's Christians that seek after truth, that seek knowledge and understanding and trying to develop wisdom, that are insulted as being easily led and blindly following. I pray for people like this. People who claim to the impermanence of man's constructions. To cling to things that are disproven. They're, they're, they're flying in the face of what is right in front of them. And I pray that they would one day, they would see the truth that's right there. That they would know the shepherd. And be called by name. I know whom I follow and why. I know that he is good and that he laid down his life to spare me. Me. And I know this not because someone told me, not because it's some far reaching, unsupported, unsubstantiated hope. I know this because I search. 
because I continue to search and I will never stop searching, gaining understanding and wisdom concerning my heavenly Father, my Savior Jesus, and the coming kingdom. If you ask me, I'd rather be a sheep any day because I know who I follow. That's the hard part for Christians. Because we may know who we follow, but how many of us are getting sucked into these ideologies of the world? Everything is painted in a nice way, right? Unless it's Christianity, everything else is painted in a nice way. Follow this movement. This will help people. Follow that movement. It'll help people. But every single one of these things that we're taught, told to, to follow and to support, and this is why we need to get out of all of this. We need to get out of the politics of this world because when it comes to following these movements, no matter how good and altruistic they may seem, they are created by men and women who are just as flawed and broken as we are. But the bad part is, is they don't have any kind of a compass worth holding on to, worth following oftentimes. Now some of them might. But this is what we can hold true to. And we can follow him. We can follow Jesus, the gate, the shepherd, to our Heavenly Father. And we can know His voice, not let us stray. Jesus commented in the very last verse here that we read, or, excuse me, others had said concerning Jesus, that a demon cannot open the eyes of the blind. This, of course, references back to what we read in chapter 9. Jesus healed a man who had been born blind from birth, but the reality is the deeper meaning that God put into this. Is that a demon cannot open the eyes to see God. And right now, we live in a world that is blindly following, a world who is blind to the truth and is following whatever feels good, whatever sounds good, And it's often at the cost, even Christians are falling into this, it's often at the cost of the truth, the reality of God's word, his will, and his ways. And so sheep are being led astray. They're becoming like lemmings. And they're not holding true to God's word. And they're, they're forgetting that voice that called them into the pen to begin with. When it comes to what we have written here, we're not, we're not part of that, shep, that, that original pasture that's written in here. We're part of that second pasture that Jesus talks about, that second flock. Those who will be brought into that pasture. So we're not part of the original. But... He says that there will be one flock and one shepherd. So we may not be the originals, but we are part of that one flock. I, I feel like the, the, the past several weeks have taken on a... a, a and I apologize to my mother-in-law with her eye issues, but I feel like our, 
our messages have taken on an issue, a, a, a theme of, of sight and blindness and not being able to see and struggling to be able to open her eyes. And I know she struggled mightily in the past and continues. She deals with things I can't even imagine. Gives me the shivers every time I even think about it. And the reason that, I, that this theme keeps coming up is because everything in the world, everything in the world that we live in is trying to close our eyes to this truth. Everything in the world that we live in is trying to lead us astray, to lead us out of that pasture, to make us forget the voice of the shepherd, and to just follow. This is God's word. If we know it, we know him. And we can't be pulled away. And so when these other forces come at us and say, hey, join us, we'll have the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding from here to help us make the good decisions, the right decisions of how best to help those around us, what to do in each situation. We're not blindly following as Christians. If anything, I hear more Christians talk about how they need to research things, to study something, than I hear most people around me that have no clue about the Bible and Christianity and God and Christ. Be proud to be a sheep. Not that I want to hear any buzz right now, but maybe later. Next week we'll continue. We'll finish up chapter 10 of John.